Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Great Room at the RSA for Revolutionary Russia with Orlando Figes. I'm Viv Groskop. I'm a journalist, broadcaster, and a judge of this year's Pushkin House Prize for Russian nonfiction. Really delighted to welcome you to today's special event. Uh, just before we begin, could I ask you to switch off any mobile phones or turn them to silent? We are live streaming this event, so welcome to all of our web viewers. And a reminder to everyone that the hashtag is hashtag Pelican Books if you want to get involved in the discussion on Twitter. Housekeeping notice is over. Great pleasure to be chairing this event today. As you may have read recently, there's been a bit of buzz surrounding the relaunch of Penguin's iconic Pelican imprint, the groundbreaking series that first appeared in the 1930s and helped democratise knowledge by offering quality introductory guides to essential topics for the general reader, and all for the price of a packet of cigarettes. For the final event of this special event series celebrating the rebirth of Pelicans, we are delighted to be joined by Orlando Figes. Orlando teaches history at Birkbeck, University of London, and is the author of many acclaimed books on Russian history, including A People's Tragedy, Natasha's Dance, The Whisperers, Crimea, and now his new offering for Pelican, An Introduction to Revolutionary Russia, 1891 to 1991. Orlando will be delivering a short lecture before joining me briefly in conversation, and then we'll be opening up to audience questions. So delighted to have you today. Orlando. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Orlando Figes. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Viv. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a wonderful location. Um, it's also sort of slightly surprising um, to be talking about the Russian Revolution in the context of what's happening today. It's come back to bite us a little bit. Um, as Viv said, I also uh, wrote a book on the Crimean War, uh, which, when it came out, uh, no one paid much attention to it. The Crimean War seemed ancient history. And then when all the Crimean crisis kicked off, I was really amused by a, um, a, a, a tweet I saw. Someone had tweeted, uh, Crimea, trending for the first time since 1854. Yeah. <laughs> so... It feels a little bit like that revisiting the Russian Revolution because for a long time it almost seems to be sort of forgotten about it. We packed it away. Uh, we thought we'd done and, you know, dusted that one. Um, communism was over. The Russian problem was over. We looked to the former Soviet states as sort of emerging democracies. For a while we thought maybe Russia might be one of them, but we soon gave up on that. But then when Putin emerged with his authoritarian reinvention of the Russian Revolution, if you like. Um, we thought, well, that doesn't really matter. It's not part of Europe anyway. But now, of course, we realize that its uh, policies are very much um, of importance to uh, Europe and uh, to the neighboring states of Russia. So I, I'm going to return to that. I'm sure you'll want to, we will want to discuss that. And I do think that there is a, an important legacy of the Russian Revolution to be highlighted in terms of uh, Russia's sense of itself, uh, Russia's domestic and foreign policies under Putin. Um, but, as I said, in, it felt uh, for a long time that, that the revolution had gone away. And when I thought about writing a concise history of it, um, which I must confess wasn't originally conceived as a book for Pelican, but when I wrote it, it then sort of turned into a Pelican um, and at that point, um, it was, seemed rather hard to think about ways of reviving the subject for a new generation. I mean, as I said, since 91, the subject academically had somewhat languished. Um, many people had abandoned Soviet studies, as it used to be called, um, and fled into other areas um, because it seemed that that intellectual sort of heritage had completely disappeared forever. Some, had some sort of, I would call them Soviet apologists, had reinvented themselves in other forms, um, some still around today um, using the same ideas uh, and same emotional impulses to uh, support Putin. Um, others had chosen other subjects and so on. 
But it always seemed to me that actually this isn't something that's going to be going away, and we have to find new ways of reviving it. And as time passed, I sort of thought, well, it's time to sort of draw a line under my own work in some ways on, on the Russian Revolution. So I've sort of gone on about it for quite a while, and as Viv said, written probably too many books on the subject. I thought, well, how am I going to d d draw that line? And writing it as I did a couple of years ago, I thought, uh, at the end of a long period of teaching a course on it, and I think if I can say something about writing for Pelican, you know, there's something really fantastic about teaching, making your ideas as clear as possible that does translate into writing for an imprint like Pelican, which is, you know, properly conceived a university for the general public. So, as a result of teaching and thinking about the subject, I thought, well, there is something to be said to, uh, if we look again at the Russian Revolution, Russia is, you know, much less of a superpower. It's, um, it's definitely a regional power and a menacing one to its neighbouring states as we see today. Um, and it seemed to me that it, it was a good opportunity to look at the Russian Revolution in the long durée as an arc because it is now genuinely history despite its afterlife and it is genuinely a completed cycle despite its afterlife. And... Um, if you look at it as one arc, then some things come into relief. Most books, most short books on the Russian Revolution, they circle around the years 1917. Um, that always struck me as an artificial sort of construct. Um, my own big book on the Russian Revolution, A People's Tragedy, went back to 1891, and that's when I decided to start this. Um, because it does seem to me that the famine crisis of that year, um, which mobilised and politicised Russian society against the autocracy, was the beginning of a revolutionary crisis. You had writers like Tolstoy and Chekhov giving up their literary careers temporarily to help in the relief campaign. You had professionals, uh, Chekhov himself, a doctor, throwing themselves into their, their work to, to help the people. You had Ziemstvas and other local bodies calling for more representation in national government. You had political parties forming. You had Marxism emerging, arguably for the first time in Russia in the 1890s, as a way of trying to understand how it could have been that Russia's fiscal policies and programme of industrialisation had led to such impoverishment of the ordinary people. So populism is now almost supplanted by Marxism as the dominant way of thinking about, about modernization and the crises that that brings about. So that's when I had no doubt about starting it, but it also seemed to me that actually in many ways the Russian Revolution doesn't end until 1991 and it would be useful to look at that arc as one, okay, neat, but actually intellectually cogent cycle of exactly 100 years. And that's not often done. I mean, if you look at the books written on the Russian Revolution, I can't actually find one that goes all the way to 91 as a revolution. Historians tend to, and political scientists tend to think of the Russian Revolution as a phase followed by the regime, a stable regime. And of course, in the, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, people thought of the revolution as something that would have to come to an end at some point, just as we think of the French Revolution as something that came to an end, I don't know, Thermidor, Napoleon's accession to be emperor, whatever, whenever you want to call it, there's a point at which you think a revolution ends and then it becomes the consolidation of a new system. And that's the way people tended to think about the Soviet Union and the Russian Revolution. So some books, like my own on uh, People's Tragedy ended 1924 when Lenin dies, others uh, ended earlier, 1921 when the Bolsheviks uh, emerged victorious from the Civil War, some people ended it in, in 1927 with the defeat of the left opposition and Trotsky, others in 1929 with the launching of the five-year plan, or 1932 uh, with the idea that you know, Soviet industrialization was the outcome of the Russian Revolution, and you're then into a phase you call the Soviet system, which is stable. And let's not forget, as late as 1987, 8, 9, it looked quite stable. People thought it was going to last. Certainly when I started studying Russian history in, 19, in the early 1980s, it looked like this was forever, until it was gone. So 
uh, that was the sort of thinking that determined uh, the writing of the Russian Revolution as, as one phase and then there's a system. And I think that no one, I don't think people then be, looked at it again because everyone was so bored and tired of it all. Um, but as I say, I think it, 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 throwing it into the relief of 100 years, trying to understand the revolution of that arc as a revolution, as a project, a utopian project, a project in human engineering, a project in social reconstruction, a project in literally thinking you're going to have a global revolution and a worker's paradise, that is the ideology, and it's an ideology taken seriously by the leaders. That ideology, in revolutionary form, continues right through till 91, I would argue. Of course they lose belief. Of course the population becomes increasingly cynical. But if you look at it as a revolution and you try and understand the, the motives of the Soviet leaders as still furthering the revolution, still carrying on Lenin's work, then some of their policies and thinking becomes clear, I think. And I don't have time to expand on that. I'm sure we can discuss it. Within that cycle, I think um, I, I would draw your attention to what I in the book call three generational phases. And in some sense, it's the life, you know, it's the birth, life, and death of the Ru Russian Revolution. And in some ways, I would argue that all revolutions probably have that natural cycle. I think it's very difficult for a revolution to continue for more than three generations. The first generation is essentially that of the old Bolsheviks, who emerge from this uh, 19th century um, uh, world of, of European Marxism and apply it in Russia, and apply it bringing Russian terrorist ideas, Jacobin ideas from the populist movement of, of assassinating leaders and trying to spark um, a putsch through popular revolt, um, and are able to do so because of the huge cataclysm of the First World War. And then they begin to improvise and try to make a new society, scratch their heads and realise this is all going to be much more difficult than we thought because we don't have a proletariat, we have a peasantry. And they are then supplanted by the second generation, the Stalin generation. That generation of the old Bolsheviks, if they haven't already died out, are finally eliminated by Stalin in 1937, the year of the Great Terror. But the new generation of Stalin is essentially the stable generation of the Soviet system. And it's, an, it's a generation that comes from rather humble working class peasant origins, is promoted through this huge state infrastructure that the Stalinist industrialization program creates. They, they take the jobs of the old Bolshevik generation and they consolidate their position in the war and the defense of that system, at whatever cost, becomes their raison d'etre. They still believe in the revolution, they still believe that Stalinism is continuing the revolution, but it's the consolidation of a system. And the third generation, I think, is marked from the uh, Khrushchev secret speech of 1956, denouncing the cult of the personality, which is, you know, the way, the only acceptable way in which someone who was deeply complicit in the Stalinist system and still a member of the Politburo, the leader of the party that had carried all this out, could try to exonerate themselves and separate where the party should be going now from what had happened under Stalin. But the denunciation of Stalin's crimes creates a sort of moral crisis of authority for the system. And... <sighs> It also creates within, the, um, it also creates within the, the leadership and within the sort of growing technocracy upon which it's based, a new generation of idealists and reformists, many of them, like Gorbachev in 1956, newly graduated as a law student from Moscow University, who came from families that had been repressed under Stalin, as Gorbachev's was, and who nonetheless believed that the system could be made to work. Gorbachev, in a sense, was the last genuine Leninist idealist. And his reforms do carry on from Khrushchev's idea of Leninist renewal. But at the same time as within the system, this new generation 
ultimately last is emerging, there's a, a really important generation gap emerging within Soviet society as in general. Because if you think about what's happened under Stalin and then the war, you've got this big gap of people, you know, very, by, 19, by the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, there's very few people still alive who can remember the Russian Revolution as, as adults. They've been wiped out by the terror and the war. You don't have many people in, already in their 30s and 40s. I mean, it's, you know, demographically, it's been squeezed by those losses of male members of the families. And you have a boom, the Soviet baby boomers. You have a very young generation coming of age in the thaw, in the 60s, and they're not interested in politics anymore. They're not in, they can't remember the October Revolution, obviously, and they're certainly not particularly interested in the war. And they're interested in material things. They're interested in the West because it delivers jazz, rock, jeans, the whole thing. And, and the system after that is essentially redefining communism, not as sacrifice for the goal of world revolution. It's, re, it's redefining communism, as the party program of 1961 does, as abundance for everybody. It's giving our economic promises, IOUs, to this generation in, to, to, to sustain belief that it can come about. Well, we all know what happened. There's economic stagnation. It, it carries on uh, f for reasons I can, I can discuss with you in question, but basically oil prices and the, 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 the inheritance of fear uh, suffocating opposition and finally collapses under, Stalin, under, under Gorbachev. Okay. At that point, as I say, we all thought Russian Revolution over. But actually... Uh, what we've seen under Putin shows that its legacies are still very much there. And to understand that, we need to realise what happened to Russia in the 1990s. And it's important for us to realise it, because in many ways the West really did let Russia down. Breakneck privatisation at a time of hyperinflation ruined those who had taken the tokens to give them a stake in the new privatised industries. The loans for shares schemes by which the West basically, uh, the Russian government, desperate to pay its employees uh, to win an election when it looked like the communists might come back to power through the ballot box, ended up with enriching the few who are now the oligarchs. Um, the biggest of the oligarchs. So capitalism and democracy for the mass of Russians looked like a really bad deal. They lost out an awful lot. They lost, lost out a lot of security. They lost uh, a lot of pride in their, in their country, which had lost its superpower status. Um, they were ideologically adrift. And moreover, they had... Uh, their own Democrats are more annoyingly foreign historians, myself included, lecturing them about how bad their history was. And, and that was not how they had been taught in their schools. That was not how they had been taught to think by the whole propaganda machine of the Soviet system, which is take pride in the great October Socialist Revolution, take pride in the great patriotic war, take pride in Sputnik, etc. We created a, a modern industrial, uh, technologically advanced state, mass education, etc., etc. So when Putin comes along and, and starts telling the population, you don't need to feel bad about your history, we must take pride in our revolutionary legacy. Uh, people relate to that. They relate to it in nationalist terms because they feel resentment towards the West for everything that's happened to their system since the collapse of the Soviet Union and they don't like the lecturing, they don't like the double standards, you know, switch on Kremlin propaganda TV, Russia T today and you'll see it's just constant propaganda about Western double standards. So what we're seeing now in, in Russian foreign policy is actually sitting very easily on this legacy of nationalism and resentment to the West as a result of what the Russians went through in the 1990s in terms of what they see as a national humiliation, defeat, ideological defeat. 
And at the same time, the uh, buttress of um, Putin's authoritarianism is another, for me, very alarming legacy of the Russian Revolution. In 2011, they showed a, a series of, of TV series, historical programs, primetime Saturday night TV, uh, the, the Court of History, in which they would have a debate about uh, really important points in Russian and Soviet history, sleep in the October Revolution, and so on. And, and the findings, you know, when they had the poll, TV polls afterwards were quite alarming, that collectivization, despite the presentation of all the evidence of collectivization as a war against ordinary peasants that accounted for millions of lives, 90% of those voting still said it was a necessary measure for industrialization. Even when they said the Stalin-Hitler Pact of 1939, you know, allowed the Second World War to take place, and it was, um, historians would come on and say it was all very, um, you know, cynical thinking on Stalin's part that led to the pact, to use the war for revolutionary purposes. Still, 90%, though it was still a justified measure to defend the Soviet Union. But for me, the thing, I just want to read you one statistic, because for me, it, it is chilling, uh, is, is a separate poll that was taken out by a polling agency in 2007 in three cities, St. Petersburg, Kazan, and Ulyanovsk, uh, symbolically Lenin's birthplace, where 71% of the population believed that Dzerzhinsky, the founder of the Cheka, you know, the KGB, had protected public order and civic life. Only 7% thought he was um, a criminal. But what's frightening is that of these, they were, of these people who thought this way, they were nearly all very well informed about what the Cheka had actually done. Most of them acknowledging that the Cheka had killed between 10 and 30 million innocent victims. So they know how many the Cheka killed, but even so, two-thirds of those respondents, knowing how many the Cheka had killed, still believed that the Cheka and Stalin had been positive for the country. This is a pathology. The acceptance of state violence for national defence, for revolutionary goals, that remains in Russia and I would say underpins a lot of what we're seeing now, and that is a legacy of the Russian Revolution. Okay, I'll end there. Thanks, Orlando. Lovely. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I'm going to kick off with the pathology to start off with, because that's such a strong, <laughs> strong word to use. Um, you described Putin with the words alarming legacy, one way to describe him, I would ask what alternatives would Russia have had other than someone like him? Well, if the implication of your question is that the, the people get the leaders they deserve, I don't think I would go that way at all. I mean, I think... I think, but I, I do think how Putin came to power and how he consolidated power with the Chechen war, you know, is a very dirty business. Um, nonetheless, it was Yeltsin who brought him in, and the machinations that went on behind that um, are, are, are interesting and not particularly um, nice to read about either. But I would say that, you know, um, so that suggests, doesn't it, that actually a lot of what we're seeing now under, under Putin is something that we were seeing already, the drift towards authoritarianism, the, the sense that the state had to be reasserted against oligarchs. All of that is something that was happening under, under, under Yeltsin, you know, the, the, the authoritarian strand was there. Could something else have developed? Yes, I believe it could have developed. I think that the Western policy in particular towards Russia and the sort of um, policies that the, the neoliberals adopted in Russia in, in the early 1990s were absolutely disastrous. I mean, I, I, I hate to say it, but I almost think, I almost think that, you know, those crucial 96 elections, uh, it would have been better to let the communists win. Um, by that stage, the communists, you know, were a bit tamer than they had been. They weren't going to be a Soviet-style communist party. It was going to be, you know, renationalization of a lot of industries, um, 
a much slower rate of, of privatization. It was going to be a big state again. Um, but frankly, you know, the, what we saw happen as a result of the 96 elections and the, and, and the emergence of oligarchism, um, you know, I, I would take the communists again. And you mentioned a lot about the idea of loss, moral crisis, and um, you describe in the book the idea that uh, Russia's never had a chance to come to terms with its legacy, and you mentioned that in your lecture as well, and the idea that if they'd had something like the South African yeah. uh, model for truth and reconciliation, that things would be different. I mean, how do you think those ideas are playing out in the current situation in Ukraine? It's a great question. Yeah, the, the last chapter is called Judgment, and it, and it tries to, it tries to um, sort of discuss what sort of closure or judgment there could be on this. Um, partly because, you know, there were people, Yeltsin, you know, the, the, the Soviet Communist Party was banned by Yeltsin in the last hours of the Soviet Union. And then they challenged it, and it went to the Constitutional Court, which was in a predicament because um, it had to operate under the old Brezhnev Constitution. And, the com and they, couldn't make, they didn't feel they could make a legal judgment. Although there were many who thought that there should be a sort of Russian Nuremberg. There should be people brought to account. Um, the prosecutors tried to drag Gorbachev onto the stand, and he said, no, why should I... Uh, the people who are responsible are all dead. Mm -hmm. and, and who were you going to prosecute legally? So I don't think that was, I think, you know, I do think the Constitutional Court got that right um, in the sense that they, they recognised that if they made prosecutions like this, um, it, they, they, it would spark civil war. Um, uh, so I think they got that right. But then one wonders, well, could there have been something, as you said, as in South Africa, truth and reconciliation? There could have been public hearings, but, you know, who was going to be... I mean, the thing is, that what's different about the Russian Revolution, why it's important to, to study it in the long durée, is because it lasts so long. You know, people were born into the system, they s were schooled in the system, they made their careers in the system, they believed in the system even when it did terrible things to them and their families. Mm. So, who, you know, everyone was complicit in it. Even if you were a doctor, a teacher, you're complicit in the system because you're... You're teaching its maxims, you're, you're saying to people, no, you can't go off work sick because it would ruin the five-year plan. So, I mean, everyone's in the system. So, at what le at where do you cut off responsibility? Mm. So, it's not like South Africa where, where you can still say, he's doing it. You can't really do that. And that's part of the reason why it, it can't be worked out now still because who, who are people to blame? They, they only have themselves to put on trial. And that means that that, um, that sort of guilt or sense of responsibility is, is, um, is, it gets very deeply buried at a societal level and at a personal level. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it means that without um, a very painful sort of reckoning through history writing, through the sort of things we saw under Glasnost, which is all, all obviously now being sort of shut down, only through a long and painful process can that sort of be worked out, I think. Mm. So instead of that, it festers, and there's this sort of resentment. Well, because what they hear sort of foreigners saying about them and the values that they're being lectured about from abroad aren't the values... They're not values they've been taught. They're not values they've lived with for a very long time. Mm. So, so that creates a, a huge problem, um, which I, I'm a bit pessimistic about the, the possibilities of it being resolved. Mm. Well, as you suggest, this, this was and is a very strong belief system. You touched upon some of the catalysts for its collapse. Could you say a bit more about that, especially the idea that it was such a surprise even to many academics and experts who thought this would go on forever? What, what suddenly went wrong? It was, it was a surprise for everybody. I think it was... I mean, I lived in the Soviet Union in the early 1980s, and it looked permanent. It looked just like everyone just sort of got used to it, you know, the propaganda out there, you sort of thought, saw the propaganda. You, in a way, in a way you, you sort of learnt to live with it at, at a level of belief that just sort of accepted it without participating in it, and you just then lived your life around the system, and cynicism grew in everybody, and all sort of jokes were told about the system, and people, you know, the black market was huge. But, you know, that sort of thing can go on forever. 
really, can't it? I mean, it goes on in Cuba still. I mean, it, it can go, you can live at a very low economic level, be just sort of basically disgruntled with the system, and it, and it doesn't, nothing changes, yeah? So, in a sense, the crisis was, was brought about from the top. Um, you know, de Tocqueville's classic statement, you know, that the, the most dangerous moment for bad government is when it tries to reform. Um, it is absolutely tailor-made for the collapse of the Soviet Union because, as de Tocqueville says, grievances, abuses that people just get used to, now are suddenly thrown into relief. And they said, well, why should we put up with this? There was a moment, I think, there probably was a moment for most people in the, in the early 1980s, late 1970s, when people said, enough, we can't really go on living like this anymore. But the problem was that for ordinary people to act on that was impossible. They had all this memory of terror. They can't, no one, the dissidents were saying it, but the, they were a tiny group. No one's going to, not many people were prepared to join the dissidents because they'd been taught that, you know, by their family histories, if you step out of line and become political, you get your hands chopped off. So that, so that wasn't going to happen. But, the, but what's interesting about the late Soviet Union is, and it's, I think still it needs its historians to work on it, is that that sense of we can't go on like this anymore was also being felt by the leadership. It was also being felt by people like Gorbachev, by people like Yakovlev, by people in all of these research institutes working for the Central Committee, who had access to foreign literature, who, who knew the realities of the Soviet countryside, and he said, we can't do this, we can't do this anymore. They, so in a sense, at the same time as still believing in the revolutionary project, they, they, they were sick of the system as it had developed and thought we have to change it. So, so that's the watershed, and reform really comes from above. Okay. We're going to come to questions in a moment, but I just wanted to step away from the theories for a moment and ask you what drives your own passion for trying to understand this? Why do you care? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, why do I care? <laughs> God, there's more to life than the Russian Revolution. But um, look, it's, um, it's, a, it's such a big, you couldn't, a historian couldn't want a bigger subject, really. Um, it's massive, isn't it? And Russia's a big, very interesting place. Um, so it's an intellectual challenge? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't have any family reason to study it. I mean, there are parallels maybe with my own family history on my mother's side, which fled Nazi Germany, but th there's no direct relevance of Russia or the Russian Revolution for me. But, yeah, it's an intellectual challenge. I think uh, when I first went to, 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 to uh, the Soviet Union or Moscow in, the, in, uh, in 1983, you know, I just sort of... you sort of fascinated by the place. And I think what's really important about... I mean, what's really important about... Uh, whether a historian is, is, can write well about a, pl about a subject is whether they, can, whether they can really understand the place. I mean, the actual place, the physicality of the place. You know, I think it's terrible. You can't... It's not enough to try and grasp Russia just intellectually. You have to sort of sense something about the place and feel that you sort of understand a little bit of what's happening. Mm, the famous Chichev quote... Yeah. Well, well, that's something slightly more mystical, and yeah, the idea that it means you, you can't, can't understand Russia with your mind. Yeah, um, which is not, I'm not quite. I don't quite subscribe to the mystical approach, to, but I certainly understand the spiritual approach to Russia. And the first thing I say to PhD students who come to me saying they want to study Russia is, "Can you? Can, how good's your Russian?" And the second thing I say is, "You know, how good are you at drinking?" <laughs> <laughs> Because if you can't drink in Russia, you're absolutely lost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, with thoughts of drinking, let's come to the audience. Um, I'm, I'd really like to take short, brief, to the point questions. I'll take them three at a time. We've got some microphones in the room, so if you could speak into the mic, that would be great. Um, and raise your hand to show. Yes, lovely. We'll take from here and here, and one over here. Lovely. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Um, when you say that the leadership said that the system couldn't carry on, presumably that was for economic reasons. The, the economy was doing particularly badly. Now, if we then go fast forward for a bit, what you're saying is that the Russian population 
look on the West in negative terms. So is there a bit of a kind of disconnect between yeah. what Russians want, that they want the material things that the West have, but don't want other things that they see from the West? Yeah, okay, very good you. question. Let's yeah, okay, go next one. Yeah. Yes, please, if you could pass the microphone forward here. Lovely, thank you. I studied Russian and Russian literature a long time ago, and I was always amazed at how wonderful their history and culture was. The intelligentsia, amazing. So when you told me those statistics of the 2007 polls and the other statistics, I was astonished. There are a lot of clever people in Russia. There are a lot of well-read people in Russia. And with that cultural history, how could they have been so blind and said, OK, Stalin was good, the purges were good, the Cheka was good. How could they have been thinking correctly and in a moral sense that uh, we, we turn a blind eye and it's all, all for the good of our nation and our um, anti-Western feeling. Okay, thank you very much. And yes, one last yeah, question. My, my question really follows on the first one, which is Russia's current economic position. Um, do you agree with those who say that, I know the BRICS is a pretty ghastly mnemonic, but they say that Russia shouldn't be included in the BRICS for two reasons, basically, that by the mid-2020s, demographics will be turning very much against them economically, and also their over-dependence on commodities, particularly on gas. Yeah. And in the light of that, is that perhaps a partial explanation for Putin's extraordinary speech yesterday? He's not a man, as, the, as Radio 4 said last night, who does U-turns. And yet there was an extraordinary softening of his approach, uh, even in regard to the forthcoming Ukrainian presidential election, which just two days before Lavrov had described as absurd. He said it's a step in the right direction. I mean, what's he playing at? Well, he's playing some game. We, should, uh, we don't quite know the next move of the game, but I suspect yeah, he did add a caveat, which he, he said, you know, before the elections take place, we have to have this dialogue about the federalization of Ukraine. And I think that's what the Russians want. They want, they don't, I don't think they want to invade or actually annex eastern Ukraine. I think they want to use the threat of that um, and to undermine Kiev to uh, impose or uh, move to the Geneva agreement dialogue uh, to a federalization that suits Russia. Um, but if I can uh, turn to the economic aspects of these questions, I think an excellent um, question. I think the, um, if we look back to the, the 1980s, I think what, I mean, in a sense, what, um, you know, is the, is the problem that Putin faces, and coming back to your question, faces now, you know, the fact that Russia really is a one-trick pony. Um, you know, how, what, what is there that you can develop an economy on? In a sense, that was, was the problem they faced back in the 1980s, because basically on the, on the back of high oil prices after the 73 crisis, you know, everything that, that you could find, more or less everything that you could buy in, 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 a, in a sort of Russian shop had been brought, bought, you know, with dollar earnings from fuel exports. Um, you know, massive, you know, one third of all uh, cereal products in Soviet bakeries were with imported grain. You know, the one effect of the Russian Revolution was to turn Russia, which in 1913 had been the world's biggest food exporter, into by 1973 the world's biggest food importer. And, and, and that, that, that's the problem, that in a sense, say, uh, the, and remains a problem now. How does the economy di diversify? If you think about the end games or the sort of, um, the sort of uh, stra economic strategies that the Soviet system could have adopted from the moment at which the leadership perceives this crisis and thinks really has to do something about it, um, you know, could they have gone the China path? It's a really interesting question. Under you know, Gorbachev, uh, when he first came to prominence in 1978, wrote a, a paper on agriculture. His wife, as you know, Raisa, was a rural sociologist. They knew about the problems of collectivization. Um, and he wrote a paper about, about agricultural reform. But you know, they're all staring it in the face, and they realize that it really is nothing. They, they can't do the China option. Why not? Because basically collectivization has killed the work ethic of the Russian people. That's the truth of the matter. Collectivization is the big catastrophe. Collectivization is 
for the majority of the Russian people, the Soviet people, the revolution. And as a result of collectivization, Soviet agriculture basically goes into terminal decline. And, and so, you know, what happened? I, I, mean, I remember going around the countryside in the 1980s and 1990s. Where was this farming class that was going to emerge and uh, resurrect the Soviet Russian economy? It wasn't there. No, people, people weren't, didn't want to work. They were on the bottle, or they were looking to speculate, or they were looking to get abroad. So, you know, it was just a terrible situation. And in a sense, it hasn't really progressed since then, because as a result of still high oil prices, you know, all we've had with, I have to underline, with the collusion of London financial institutions and Western governments, which have taken Russian dirty money, allowed Russians to buy up what they want with their dirty money. As a result of that collusion, we now just have an oligarchy, which basically steals the assets of Russia. Yes, you have a middle class has emerged. Yes, multinationals have gone in. There's an infrastructure, economic infrastructure of sorts. But where's the diversification? Where is, you know... You could say the sanctions might help Russia because it would help small-scale industry to sort of start. But where is this industry? It's not really developing. The infrastructure isn't there. No one invests in infrastructure because you can't make corrupt money out of it. And, and then there's, you know, there's, the, there's the problem of corruption. You know, the, the, the demonstrations against Putin were by the Tvorshevsky classes, the, the professional middle class who are fed up with corruption. And if they have any sense, they leave. Uh, so it's, that's the situation, and, and you know, it, it goes back to the um, initial crisis of the Soviet Union in the 1980s, and it hasn't really changed. Uh, coming to your excellent question about the uh, about the about you know how could people have these attitudes? You know, let's not. I mean, fant wonderful intelligentsia. Let's not overestimate. You know, let's, but let's not overestimate its size. It always was a small elite intelligentsia. It has been devastated by the loss of its professional status, uh, earning capacity, and many people have gone abroad. Um, it still has a vibrant intelligentsia. Um, but, um, you know, and you see them on the streets of um, Balotna Square in demonstrations. But, uh, but Putin's base of Russian nationalism is speaking to other people who, who, who don't understand what's happened to them in, in the ways that we might want them to, and who do have different values. Just to, as a counter, what would be the counterpoint to the argument that you're making? Is this almost like a sort of UKIP characterization of Russians? <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. all, they know that, that there's this sort of climate of fear and it all feeds into nationalism. Surely there's, there are a lot of points in Russia's favour that there is this growing middle class. And sure, sure. No, look. There are issues around freedom of speech, but are they as much as we make out in the West? Just playing devil's advocate. Yeah, no, 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 fair enough, fair enough. Look, there, there's a big middle class and it's growing and, and, and that's good. And, I, and that is, that is um, in the end, going to create a different sort of society which as time passes, might yeah, um, actually demand political change, might demand, um, if only, you know, might demand more, more from their rulers, might get fed up with the corruption. Um, you know, it's not a basket case, it's a powerful economy. Um, it's a big regional power. The demographic side of it is really serious. Um, and, and it is essentially, you know, both the, 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 um, the, the terrible death rates among, because of, largely because of alcoholism, um, and a poor national health system, um, and it's, um, but it's also because people just aren't having kids. Um, and that, and why, why do people not have kids? In a society, people don't have kids because they don't really believe in the future. So there's, um, yeah... They can go off to Ikea on the outskirts of Moscow. They can buy what they need for their normal life they're constructing in, in their homes. And they have some security of jobs. And they have lots of travel opportunities. And all that's good. And maybe that will feed into a different sort of society with, with more political expectations. Mm -hmm. 
But that will take time. That mm -hmm. will take time. Mm -hmm. Do you want to put a time scale on it? Well, those sort of things take generations, don't they? Mm -hmm. Those sort of things take generations. And, um, and meanwhile, you know, it, it is being... Uh, the government's rightly worried about the demographics. Um, and, um, you know, there's also a sort of racial element to this because increasingly the country's sucking in immigrants from Central Asia and China uh, and, and, and uh, you know, that, that, is, that is potentially a problem of extremism in Russia. Uh, let's hope it doesn't get to that. But mm -hmm. it, the, the, the demographics have to be addressed. And, you know, again, this comes down to where, where's been the investment in civil society? Where's been the investment in the infrastructure? Where's been in the investment in schools and hospitals and roads and everything else that you need for, for, for economic uh, renewal? Mm -hmm. There's just been a cannibal thieving of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and so I'm sort of not too optimistic about it, really, but you can hope. Mm -hmm. More questions? Yes, one here and next to you and one at the back there. Hi. Without wanting to sound either like an apologist or go to a crude dialectic, don't we have to understand the whole long arc through a contrast, through the actions of the West from intervention in 1919, from invasion by the Nazis in 1941, to the Cold War, to a naive belief that instituting markets would lead to democracy in the 1990s, that we do have things happening outside Russia which are also creating what's happening inside Russia. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Is this all our fault? Yeah. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, you, you haven't actually mentioned the Cold War, as this Dr. Rivers did. Um, would you say that we won, in inverted commas, the Cold War because we bluffed them into spending more money than they bluffed us? Okay, shall I take question. those two together? Um, let's just take one? one more at the back and then we'll come back. Yep. You were very critical of the West's policies in the past. Are you as critical of those policies today in relation to Ukraine in particular? Great. Um, yeah, okay, they all come together. Can I address the first one while I think what I'm going to say to your two? But the... Um, Yes, I think the West has made some mistakes. I think um, there, were, there were too many foreign advisors wading into Maidan and uh, too much uh, assurance given um, blank checks written to an interim government. Um, I think it was a mistake uh, for Western influence, which was critical for the interim government, to, um, it was a mistake for, for, for the Western in, um, advisors and uh, 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 institutions to allow uh, far-right elements to enter the interim government, um, even for the you know, the law uh, demoting Russia, Russian as an official language. I know it was revoked soon afterwards, but that was a very bad mistake. Um, uh, and I think it was a mistake not to talk to Russia from the start, um, as if you could have a solution for Ukraine with an anti-Russian government without taking into account what those Russians who identify with Russia or who want a more federal Ukraine with more autonomy for Russian-speaking areas and rights, without taking that or Russia itself into account. So I think um, th there have been mistakes. And I think, um, you know, I know legally the uh, U U uh, Kiev interim government, you know, on 25th of February passed the law for the elections and that has to take legally 90 days. You know, if you think back to 1917, <laughs> there was then the collapse of a, there was a revolution in February. There was a provisional government and they had laws about elections and they carried out this to the letter of the law for the constituent assembly elections. But unfortunately, by the time the constituent election, uh, assembly elections were held, the country was in civil war. And so you know, there's a sense in which you need elections slightly quicker than the West has been allowing this interim government um, to carry out. But that's a, a point one could discuss for a long time. Coming to your, your, um, your questions about... Sure, look, uh, sure, um, the Russian Revolution from beginning to end was fought on the idea of we are surrounded by a hostile capitalist system and we have to 
um, build our revolution as a fortress, um, retain strict control over foreign trade, foreign travel, what comes into the country, over um, our um, intellectual ideological system, uh, to arm ourselves ideologically against the West. And the best form of defense against the West is to launch revolution abroad. So the Cold War is, as I've argued in the book, an international civil war. The Great Patriotic War is, at the beginning and the end, fought within the context of an international civil war. That's all part of it. Um, but coming back to your, your question, I don't think, and I think it was implied in gentleman's first question, I, I don't think we should overestimate the impact of the West on Russian, Russian policy. You know, there's actually very little influence the West has on how Russia conducts its business. We're flattering ourselves to think that we in the West can somehow influence Russia. It's a big country, it has all sorts of issues with the West. Um, we need to understand how to talk to Russia, especially with its present government, better. But the idea that we can sort of influence Russia or how, how, where it goes from here, I think, um, or, or control its behavior insofar as they impinge on our values, I think that's naive. Great, thank you. I hope we're not just talking to ourselves. <laughs> I'll take, I hope we can fit in three more points. So from this gentleman here, and you, sir, and you over here, please. Uh, thanks. You. Interesting what you say, but purely from uh, what, inverted commas, Western point of view, I reckon. But leaving alone the past, if we come to the present, Crimea, first of all, it's not the cannons to the left of them or cannons to the right and all that sort of thing. It was crystal clear to me when I saw a United States destroyer coming through the Bosphorus into the Black Sea that the Russians are first-class chess players. And this happened in uh, Kosovo, that first thing, whoever was leading, whether it was the military or whether it was Putin, they had to safeguard Crimea for their base. So in chess terms, castling. So that was crystal clear to me, and that's what I wrote at the time. But uh, in general terms, may I just say? Your question is? Well, the question is, could you, I wonder if uh, there's time for you to talk about this. I've got a massive, I've got a very big book on Russia and the Russians on my desk. And I asked the gentleman sitting next to me at Chatham House, uh, no, at the Royal Society, uh, can you remember who wrote this? He says, it was me. Yes. <laughs> the thing is that uh, the leaders in Russia, Soviet Union, if you like, Stalin was from Georgia, Khrushchev was from Ukraine, and others from different places. So it's very difficult to imagine that a Russian could have led the Soviet Union as it was. And now the question today is, could you answer this if you like, that what Putin is saying is that he's going for an Asian, Eurasian group. In other words, the big states now are China, India, and, and Russia. I don't think we need to worry too much about further west. But what so do you think? is this a Eurasian coup? Is well, that, that, that was the question. OK, how, I'm going to move this on to the next person. Thank you. Thanks Thank very you. much for your points. In his memoir, Bruce Lockhart say, states that uh, the Bolsheviks were successful in 1917 largely because of the failure of the provisional government to end the war with Germany and her allies. And for that, he blamed Britain and the Western, and the Western allies. How far do you think that today that uh, we in the West should be engaging with the opposition which you described in Russia 
and how far should we be engaging with Putin despite what's happening in the Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. And one last question from over here. My A-level, uh, my coursework, has to uh, answer uh, how far the aims and methods of all the leaders of Russia from Alexander II to Khrushchev change and how they were different or similar. I was wondering what your response to that would be. Ah. <laughs> ah. I was meant okay. to put this plug bring, in, but yeah. I have a website for A-level students, and um, oh. <laughs> which brings Are together all my work for <laughs> schools and colleges. Orlandofiges.info. Free. Go to it. You'll find some help. On the on the um, other questions, uh, is it a Eurasian Union? Well, sure. Economically, that's what Putin is offering, or was offering, and trying to sort of fall through under Yanukovych. And I think definitely we're seeing and will see. Um, a, a turning into this Eurasian conception of, uh, of Russian statehood um, and foreign policy as a result of this crisis, as we did after the first Crimean War in the 1850s, for that matter. Um, uh, what was the other question? The, oh, Lockhart, yeah. The, uh, what a good question. Um, I think that... Um, <sighs> I think that we, are, obviously our sympathies are for the opposition. I would hope mine are anyway. But I think as a government, uh, all Western governments have no choice but to talk to Putin. Because without uh, the Russian government, which is Putin, uh, there's no solution to the Ukrainian crisis. The Ukrainians might not want to think that. We might not want to think that. We might want to think that Ukraine should be able to resolve its uh, internal divisions and come to a new constitution without external interference or influence. But the geopolitics of the matter is such that, that that's um, also naive to think that it's possible. So r without Russia's um, agreement to, uh, to um, or at least its tacit approval of, of what happens, I don't think it's a lasting solution to the Ukrainian um, a state can, can be found unless it is federalised. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid we've got to wrap up on that point. Um, thank you so much to Orlando Fajis and to all of you for your brilliant questions. I'm so sorry if you didn't get a chance um, to finish all your points or to, make, to ask a question, but Orlando will be available to sign copies of the book um, just now in the foyer if you'd like to get a copy before you leave. I really recommend it. Extremely readable, extremely accessible and something we should care about. Uh, so thank you so much to all of you. Please do continue the conversation with us on Twitter, hashtag Tag Pelican Books or at Orlando Fiji's. Dot, dot info. Or dot info, <laughs> indeed. Uh, so thank you so much to all of you, to the RSA Pelican Books and to Orlando Fiji's.